Hello, and welcome to the EVO seminar series. Today's lecture is going to come from Maria Reboleda Gomez, who is going to be presenting on this really fantastic multicellular yeast system. And we've had a lecture in the past about this, so we're, you know, we can check back in the archives for that. Um, but I, I, it's super fascinating research, um, just how multicellularity evolved and all the intricacies of that. Um, so with that, I will give it to Maria and we can begin. So, hi, thanks. I'm really happy to be talking to you guys. And this is like work I did during my PhD, but it's still pretty new. Uh, we're just getting in published currently. So I, I don't know. I think it's exciting to share it first with you. Um, so I'm gonna share this screen with you. Cool. So I got really interested about multicellularity a long time ago. And I think a big question is how and at what point we go from a collective of cells to a sort of entity of its own. But I think while that is an amazing and super interesting question, it's not the only question that we can ask on these transitions. And so one way I like to approach this is thinking a little about space. And so I've always been fascinated by architecture and the ways the, that our spatial surroundings affect how we interact with each other and actually our interactions shape the space. So this is a building in Berlin and after wars and homelessness and then people taking over it and remodeling <laughs> it has been changed over and over again and now the space it is it it sort of shows how people have interacted with this building but we are not the only organisms that modify space and so the history of life is marked by major changes that have completely changed um, what life is and how we think about it and so the evolution of multicell of the first animals gave rise to a whole lot of changes in the environment, created the first sort of coral. Well, they were not coral, they were like sponge reefs. Um, the evolution of vascular plants created the like forests of the Carboniferous. Um, and so we have these major traits that when they evolve, they actually allow organisms to completely change their environment, and then other organisms will change in response. And so one reason I really like to think about spatial structure is because it affects a lot of different processes in life. And so we know that spatial structure affects sort of the diversity that we see in different places, who gets to colonize where, how things diversify in different places, what things go extinct. Um, and so that shapes the processes of the different ecological communities we see, um, the diversity we see in different places. But also spatial structure, depending on the heterogeneity of resources and how resources are distributed, it shapes sort of processes of diversification and um, coexistence. And lastly, the part that I'm most interested in is that spatial structure can really affect interactions of cooperation. And so basically we can think that space affects how organisms interact with each other, so it affects their ecology and that can feed back in their evolution. And on the other hand, as organisms evolve, they might change this, their space and thus affect their ecology. So two big questions I like, have been asking for a long time is, how does the spatial structure of the environment and ecological dynamics in space affect evolutionary processes? And also how does evolutionary change affects a spatial ecology, a spatial organization, and that feeds back into the ecology. 
And so today I want to talk on sort of addressing these questions with a cool system, which is um, an experimental evolution of multicellularity. And so I'm first going to briefly walk you through the model system, um, which you all are, as, I, as I've heard, a little bit familiar with it. Um, but I'll still sort of just walk through it. And then I'll talk about two different um, parts of the work I've been doing. One is on the spatial constraints for multicellularity. So how when multicellularity evolves, it actually changes space and that can, it changes how cells are organized and it changes the size of the organism and that can affect its success. But also, I'm going to talk about how when multicellularity evolves, it changes the spatial complexity. So now we don't have a sort of homogeneous environment with cells floating around. We still suddenly have groups of cells that have their own spatial gradient, and that changes a lot of things about the environment. So Multicellularity is one of the major transitions in evolution. So these are changes from like relatively simple units that come together and form a more complex entity. To chromosomes, um, cells into the prokaryotic cells into the eukaryotic cell, multiple cells into a multicellular organism, and multiple multicellular or unicellular organisms into more complex societies. But in, in all these cases, these transitions have often generated new spatial structure and new dynamics. And so chromosomes have clear organization, spatial organization, um, both just in the chromosome and chromosomes within the cell. The same, the eukaryotic cell has a spatial complexity on organization that was not previous, um, previously available to prokaryotic cells. Multicellular organisms have organization in tissues or just cells in different parts and differentiation of cells depending on where in the organism they are. And then the sort of nests and colonies of multicellular of societies uh, have their own spatial complexity. Um, the problem with these transitions is they're often hard to study because they happen long ago and we don't often have a direct um, ancestor that's still ex living. And so they become, it's hard to do experiments, it's hard to manipulate the environment. And so we study these uh, ecological interactions in a model organism that basically evolved in the lab. So this is the snowflake yeast, and it's multicellular yeast that evolved after selection in the laboratory. So Will Radcliffe and Mike Travisano started this experiment where they started with single cell brewer's yeast, the same in, that's in beer and bread, and grew it in rich media for 24 hours and then centrifuge very slowly so that only the biggest things would drop to the bottom and then discard the top and just transfer that bottom to start a new population so only those big things that would settle those would get passed to the next generation and after 60 days, in 10 out of the 10 populations, multicellular, a form of multicellularity had evolved. And so this system is really cool because it recently evolved multicellularity. The environment is easy to manipulate. We have multiple independent but comparable events. So that means we can do replicate experiments. The unicellular ancestor is known. And we have a sort of fairly complete fossil record because we can freeze these um, yeast at different time points and then we can grow them again and compete them, etc. And this environment is interesting because this experiment has sort of 
two temp different temporal parts. You can think of them as like two different seasons or something. Um, so at first, organisms um, are growing and it's better kind of to be small so that you can grow better. But after they grow, we have this settling phase where it's better to be big so that you actually go to the bottom. And we do that again and again. And so eventually what they, these organisms is this sort of- Maria, can I pause you right there for a second? Yes. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit on why it's better to be small? Um, why, why being small helps you grow better? Yeah. Um, so basically when you're really big, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that, but you can imagine these things are not yet, they're multicellular, but they're not in any form as complex as we are. And so we have a circulatory system, we have a digestive system, and all these things allow nutrients to go and distribute over all the cells in our body. But if you have these things that are pretty big and they have multiple cells, but they are not, they don't have a clear circulatory system or anything like that, then nutrients they start going and the cells in the outside are directly exposed to all the nutrients. But as you go further in, it takes longer for nutrients to diffuse and it takes longer to sort of grow than whatnot. In addition, yeast, as many other microorganisms, are pretty sensitive to high cell density and they actually downregulate the growth when they are in sort of high densities because other cells start producing a lot of waste and other things that kind of stunt grow. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no space to grow. So those are all things that are affecting how things grow. So you have that very big clusters. If they could get as big as, you know, the biggest they could get, they would still be settling faster every time they get bigger. There's a sort of constraint on how big you can get because cells would not get sort of food and other things. And so it's this sort of cool trade-off that has shaped a lot of their interaction and their evolution after that. Um, and there's some cool physical constraints in addition. So as these things get bigger, if they divide in the middle, they sort of end up breaking in half just by pure tension forces. And so that's sort of where things are. Um, cool, thank you. Is that, is that clear to everybody? Great. Cool. Okay. And just uh, um, please pause me um, whenever. I have a question. Yeah. So you, you said when, when they are bigger, they're able to rupture and then form more cells, right? Yeah. More than so, more cells, um, they form more of these multicellular things. Say that again. So Can you repeat that again, please? Yeah. It's not necessarily that they form more cells. It's the same number of cells, but when they break, they break into more groups. So you have the same number of cells, but more multicellular entities. And when, and, and when you have the same number of cells, but more multicellular entities, those, those multiple entities then have a faster cellular growth rate than yes. in the single yes. entity? Yes. Um, okay. So, sorry. So the life cycle they sort of evolve is they start as many organisms as small little propagules and then they grow and eventually reach a clear state of maturity. That octopus is so cute. 
<laughs> Baby octopi are so cute. Um, <laughs> and then eventually they reproduce. Um, and so the way these ones reproduce is with that breakage. And so at the beginning, the yeast would like grow really big and just break by pure tension. Oh, sorry. Um, they would break by pure tension, but eventually they evolve higher rates of apoptosis, so like cell death. And that creates points where they can break easier. And so then they started breaking in smaller propagules. And that gives them an advantage when they need to be growing. And so here is a picture. So the cool thing is that yeast cells, the way they are becoming multicellular is after cell division, mother and daughter cell don't separate from each other. So what you're seeing here is the parts where they remain attached by the cell wall of the cells. And so that's what's in like fluorescent blue. And so you see the mother and daughter are still attached by cell wall. And so that creates a um, sort of cool way of, of growing because yeast um, can also form groups by aggregation. And that's what happens in beer. When you make beer, um, brewers often select for yeast that flocculate because then they form these big groups of cells coming together and that they settle at the bottom of the beer and then you can clean the beer for, for yeast, um, clean the yeast out of the beer after fermentation. And so that sort of, what we see here in the aggregative growth form where multiple cells independent of their genotype just come together and form these like big groups and then those groups can fracture in different ways. But what we have with the snowflake is the cells are growing in a sort of branching pattern, which means that if a new mutation would arise, let's say that green thing, green pheno phenotype, um, then all the cells from there would be green. And so then when it breaks, it breaks up these branches. And so it's very likely that clusters will be, that the propagules will just be clonal. And that keeps, that sort of keeps cheaters in check. Because if you imagine that the green is a cheater, in the aggregated form, you, you are not getting rid of it. And the cheaters are taking advantage of the majority of cooperation, cooperators that are there. But in the snowflake form, the cheaters are going to get separated from the cooperators. And often, cheaters depend on cooperators to have a higher fitness. And so if you put them apart, then a group of only cooperators would do better than a group of only cheaters. Um, and so that's how you get. And many multicellular organisms have these life cycles where they go through a clonal bottleneck. So we go through single cell bottlenecks at every um, sort of cycle, the zygote. It's a single cell. And in this case, they go through like, it's a, it's a few cells, but it's a still sort of clonal and it works like single cell. And so what was really interesting is that these 10 populations that evolved um, multicellularity, they all looked, they all, all were multicellular, they all developed in the same ways, but they were slightly different one from another. And so I don't know if you can see here, but the different pictures show they have different cell sizes, different densities of cells, different overall group sizes. And so I started being really interested in this when I started my PhD. Um, and so can you go back to that image for a second? What? Can you go back to that image for a second? Yep. Um, so are all of these to scale? So, so, uh, yep. like, so the ones in three, the cells in three are much bigger and they're, and, and also much less densely packed. Yep. 
And actually, I mean, these pictures are like Will kind of on purpose for these images chose clusters that were more or less similar sizes. Mm -hmm. But like that too, that's kind of the adult size in that population. Mm -hmm. Whereas three is still a sort of propagule. Those get like really big. Right. Um, and so I took a hundred of these isolates. So 10 out of each of the 10 populations. And what's, what's important to know here is if I would take one of these isolates, you know, a single multicellular individual, and I grow it again, it grows to the same size distribution all the time. If I grow it again, I get the same size distribution. And then I grow it again and the same size distribution. So this size is fairly heritable and it gets passed. Mm. So the differences we see are heritable and could be selected for. Um, so I took 10 isolates out of the 10 populations. And what we observed was a lot of diversity. So the different colors are the different populations. And you can see from like population 10, which is the black one to population three, there's like orders of magnitude difference in size. And this is grown without any selection pressure. So you just, you just incubate them and see what happens. Yeah, um, but if you remove selective pressures for a long time, and I'll talk a little about that, they eventually start becoming smaller and then eventually unicellular. It takes a long, long time, but it happens. Um, in this case, I just grew them like one day. And then if I wanted to do it again another day, but I, I would not do more than like three or four days without selection in this case. I see. Um, yeah, um, and then the, but we see a lot of diversity between populations, but also within populations. So you can see, for example, the red ones, we have two groups, ones that are sort of smaller and then ones at the end that are much bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was very interesting and that will sort of become important later on but i started being fascinated by this because this is often an overlooked aspect of multicellularity there has been more than 20 independent origins of multicellularity and they are all very different and so i think something i really want to stress that in this talk is while ideas about cooperation and cheating are really important. They cannot possibly be the full story because all these multicellular forms have managed ways of dealing with cooperation and cheating. And nonetheless, they're still very different and there's many consequences after that. And so it is a big part of, in general, how you become multicellular, but it still is not the whole explanation of what multicellular evolution is and what are the consequences of multicellularity and how cells interact within an organism. Um, so the first sort of part I want to talk is these things got pretty massive, pretty big. And so, as I said before, there's actual costs of being big um, in terms of like growth and access to nutrients and things like that. And so it has often been talked that one of the major advantages of multicellularity is this big size. And so here there are rotifers um, and the rotifers are eating yeast. So in red is single cells of yeast and in blue is the multicellular yeast. And so I'll um, replay these. Oh. Why? Um, and you'll see the rotifer is trying to eat one of the multicellular yeasts and it just, it doesn't fit in. And so it survives versus the red ones. You can see the guts of the rotifer are full of red yeast. 
Um, yeah, so we have a big advantage of multicellularity. Um, and that has been recognized by many of like, wow, big size is probably the reason multicellularity evolved in the first place. But there's also big costs of being big. And so here's what I was talking about. So this is on the y-axis is the growth rate. And as I said before, it's very difficult when you're thinking about multicellular and unicellular to compare these two things and see what good measure of fitness is. So in this case, the growth rate is by biomass to standardize multicellular and unicellular growth. So these are micrograms per hour. And these are the growth rate um, and over a, a concentration of nutrients. Um, and so what we see overall is the multicellular growth is at almost all concentrations of nutrients is lower than their unicellular ancestor. Um, so they are growing slower in liquid. They are not getting access to nutrients in the same way. Could you explain the what the, the difference between the two charts on that slide are? Yes. So there's two big parameters that um, describe microbial growth. One is the mu max so that's the maximum growth rate that you can get and so if you think these curves that you're seeing kind of have an asymptote at some point and that mu max is telling you where that asymptote would be so it's basically saying if you had is the point at which growth becomes saturated. So there's a point where if I add more nutrients, it doesn't matter. Cells can not keep dividing faster than they are. They can, you know, they, there's only so many nutrients they can process within some time. So that's at the point where there's no nutrient lim limitation. They're just limited by their own rates. That's the mu max. And that's at the, the far right side of the x coordinate? That's in the little plot, that's the y-axis. And that would be, in the big plot, that would be at the y-axis, the sort of asymptote of this um, line. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then the case of s, which is in the y-axis of the small plot, um, that is the concentration of nutrients at which growth is half of the maximum velocity. And so what that is, is basically at what, how efficient are cells using nutrients? So if you need less nutrients to get to that if you have a lower um case sub s it means that with less nutrients you're growing faster so even in conditions of nutrient limitation you're still growing um so we can see in that plot the unicellular one which is the darker gray has a higher a slightly higher um, maximum, like mu max, so a higher overall velocity. So even if it had infinite number of resources, it would still be growing a little bit faster than the multicellular. But it also has a lower um, case of this, and that the mu max is not significant. The confidence intervals are overlapping, the confidence ellipses. So because these things are not linear, you cannot just do linear confidence intervals. That's why there are ellipses around this. Um, and so the case of S is lower in the unicellular, which means that with less 
resources, it would still it would be still growing faster. So over the over the whole range is growing faster. And that's a significant difference. Yes. Um, and so you can see the whole curve over all resources. The gray one is the multicellular, and that's always below. No matter what the concentration of resources is, it always has a slightly lower growth rate. And so that one is in liquid. That's how they evolve. And this is without settling selection if you just keep them in liquid well shaken. So that's sort of what you would expect because multicellular clusters are bigger. So there's some cells that are probably not getting as much nutrients, are taking longer to grow. Um, and that's what you would expect. The first thing that was slightly surprising to us, but then is that when you grow them in plates, they have exactly the same growth. There's no difference. Multis and unis have the same growth. And then, but when you think about it, it actually is not that surprising. So in a plate, um, think, let me just get out of here for a second. Um, So on a plate, you have that cells, yeast cells don't, cannot move on a plate. They don't have flagella, they don't have cilia, they don't have mechanisms of movement. And so when they're in a plate, they're just, if you have a single cell on a plate, it's just gonna divide and the next cell is gonna stay in its place. Even if they are separated, they cannot just physically separate. This is plate growing on some sort of agar nutrient jelly? Yeah, so like in agar. Mm -hmm. And so they'll stay all together. And so in that way, a colony of yeast, a single cell yeast, is very similar to a multicellular organism. They're just all just growing there. All the cells that stay together, mm -hmm. they pay the same cost. Um, so that's... That was sort of, at that moment, what we thought. But what gets really interesting is we then competed them. And so we put half of unicellular, half multicellular, and grow them in liquid for four days. And at the beginning and at the end, played them, count how many were unicellular, count how many were multicellular, and see how their relative frequencies um, had changed over time, right? And so what we saw there, when we compare their, their fitness, um, the relative fitness to each other, is that in liquid we have what we would expect. So, at the dash line one, they would have equal fitness. And on the x-axis is the different multicellular isolates we used. And so in these points show that most populations, they pay a cost in liquid when competed with their um, unicellular ancestor. But what's even more interesting is even though, I mean, this is expected. We saw that when we grow them in liquid, they already are paying a cost. So that cost is what we're seeing here. But what's interesting is that in plates, they show the same growth. But when we compete them, they actually pay an even larger cost. And so this really confuse us for a while like so that that contradicts the chart on the previous slide right yes okay so how could they grow the same but then have lower fitness than there's the single cells that was sort of the the puzzle and this is fitness as measured by cellular like mitosis rate this is fitness this is relative fitness in competition. So it's basically, 
what's the relative change in frequency of unicellular and multicellular over time when they are competing to each other? Hmm. Um, and so the way we, what we hypothesized might be going on um, is, imagine you have 10 cells that are single cells and you spread them on a plate. And so then they are gonna be all over the plate, right? Imagine now that you spread just 10 cells that are a multicellular organism. They will all land together. So what's gonna have happen is, even though each of those single cell colonies is growing like the multicellular organism, each single cell gets access to, no, to different local resources in the plate, and they are not really competing against each other. Whereas the multicellular organism, all the cells are competing for the same resources. So we did some simulations of this to see if this could be what's going on. So we use the parameters we had measured of growth, and knowing the size distribution of the multicellular organisms. And so we took all these measure parameters and we made these simulations. And so at the bottom, we have the sort of resources on the plate. And we start with the same resources all over the plate. And we sort of drop single cells or multicellular organisms in a way that there's equal number of cells um, of each. So the total number of cells is the same for single cells and multicellular organisms. And then <clears throat> these are, so even though these are three plots for clarity, this is all sort of on top of each other. It's like the plate and the multicellular and the unicellular organisms are all in the same plate competing for the same resources. Is that clear so yeah, far? Yeah. Okay, and so initially we get that the multicellular organisms, because they, at each point they start with more cells, they start sort of growing faster. But over time we get that the unicellular organisms, because they have more access to the whole plate, they are growing all over the plate and they are growing really fast. Whereas the multicellular organisms kind of grow, eat all the resources in their area, and then they can only move to like the adjacent cells, but they cannot just travel really fast, far. And so they basically eat their local resources and start slowing their growth. And what, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> what that means is that over time, so these colors are too similar, I think, um, but the gray, which is, a, this line at the bottom um, is the multicellular organisms. So over time, the multicellular organisms become less, less common. And the, the unicellular, which is the black, basically starts dominating. And the reason there's those like spikes is because at, after each 24 hours of growth, the simulation and the same in the competition experiment goes like, we take all the cells that were there, dilute them and plate them again in a new plate so that they can grow again and again. And every time we do that, we get less multicellular organisms and more single cells. I see. I see. So can you talk to the color? That one. That one. Um, okay. Um, okay. There's a bit of an echo. I'm going to mute you. Okay. Um, so the, the center column, uh, or the center row and the top row, they're mirror images of each other. Is that true? That, like, it basically says that wherever there is not multicellular yeast, there's unicellular yeast and vice versa? Yeah, so there's a few cells. Um, I don't know if I can get a pointer somehow. Let me see. Well, I guess I can show it like this. So there's some points, like... Here, for example, this one is this one. Mm -hmm. And in that cell, there's 
both. There's some unis and some multis competing against each other. Mm -hmm. And that's why neither gets to full density there. So I this one doesn't get to completely dark blue, nor does this. Um, but then there's other places like these ones where multis sort of got there, took the resources, and there's no single cell that is able to grow there. Mm -hmm. For the most part, the plate is just taken over by unicellular, and that's why there's all this empty space of multicellular. This is all taken already by um, single cells. Growing. And are the, just in general, are the multicellular yeast capable of living at higher densities? Like selection, selection benefits aside, or fitness benefits aside, like the are the cells packed more densely when they're when they're in a snowflake? Um, that is possible. We don't know, and in this simulation, at least, we're not. We are assuming that we are assuming that the density they can reach on a patch is the same. Mm -hmm. um, because and it's not only. Um, it's not only a packing issue, it's a resource use. So like at that point, there's almost no, you can see on the bottom line, there's almost no resources. So even if they could pack more cells there, there's just no food. I see. And, and so there's, there's numbers there. So, so each cell contains 180,000 cells. Mm -hmm. Each mm -hmm. square contains 180,000 cells. So that's, that's and, and each snowflake contains a few hundred cells or a yeah. thousand cells? Yeah, so this is like many snowflakes in some ways. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And so I think this is one of the main results of, the, of this experiment or and these simulations. And what's cool about it, in some ways, once you think about it, it's pretty, it's kind of even obvious. It's like, well, of course, if you have more cells in a place, they're gonna compete with for resources and they're sort of gonna slow their own growth. That that's, makes sense. But I think what's interesting is what it means for how we think about multicellularity in general. And the cool thing is that most multicellular, most origins of multicellularity happen in water where resources were sort of better mixed and organisms could, could move, move easily. And they only came to land once they had evolved fairly sophisticated dispersal mechanisms. So by the time animals reach land, we have evolved all sorts of locomotion. By the time plants reach land, they have like motile gametes that move in water. They have spores that can move away. Um, and so, you know, these dispersal mechanisms need to be in place before you can be in a completely spatially structured environment. You think about corals or something like that, that they are like fixed in a place, but when they produce gametes, they just like shoot them up to the water and make them float away. Um, and the only multicellular origins that actually evolve in land is like, Dictyostelium or the like, um, or some, well, fungi we still don't know, but potentially some fungi where what happens there is these cells can, first of all, they can live on their own, they have motility on their own. And when they form a multicellular entity, this multicellular entity is in itself a dispersal structure, it's a fruiting body something that will fly spores, something like that. And so I think this cost of dispersal is actually a pretty significant limitation on the evolution of multicellularity. And it also limits 
the potential for cooperation to evolve. And so let me go a little forward and then I'll go back. So if we think of sort of evolution by natural selection, we have, you know, the ingredients we need is variation. Let's say we have these orange and blue circles. And then there's differential reproductive success. So blue circles reproduce more than orange. And these differences are heritable. So like blue circles not only have higher chances of surviving and reproducing, but they also pass whatever traits make them more successful. They pass those traits to their offspring. And so that's sort of the ingredients you need. But there's also research competition that shapes sort of how successful you are. So you can imagine, you know, those red squares are your resources. And let's say the blue one, as it starts growing, it consumes resources. And because it grows faster, it consumes the resources and it doesn't, it basically is taking over the resources that the orange could use for growth and reproduction. If we have multiple patches, if we have spatial structure, this is spatial structure and some dispersal between these patches can actually allow for coexistence. Because we could have that while the blue one is better at growing and consuming resources, the orange is better at moving away. So eventually the orange can get to patches where the blue one is not taking all the resources and sort of survive there. While when the blue gets there, it really eats everything. So why do, does all this have to do with cooperation and multicellularity? So if we think that cooperation are traits that are costly for the cooperator, but generate some group benefits, we can imagine that, let's say we have these resources and these cannot be eaten as they are. But the blue one, which is a cooperator, secretes this enzyme or whatever that breaks it into smaller resources. And these are smaller pieces, both the blue one, which is the one that produced this, let's say, costly enzyme can eat, but also the orange one that did not pay the cost can consume these resources. What's gonna happen here, else being equal, is that the blue one is paying a cost and so the orange can consume the resources without paying that cost and can grow faster and outcompete the blue one. If we have spatial structure, however, the orange, if it arrives to an empty patch, it just cannot eat those resources unless there's a blue there that can break them. So it will die. And so it's more likely that the blue ones will able to expand all over the place. But even if the orange ones outcompete the blue ones in a particular patch, over the whole sort of space, the blue ones are going to be doing better. And so the problem is, if we have way too much dispersal, it becomes a sort of well-mixed environment where everyone is competing with everyone, because both blue and orange will get everywhere. But if we have too little dispersal, however, what's happening is the blues then are not moving enough and are consuming their own resources and basically extinguishing their own patch. And then it doesn't matter, they are cooperating. Because they're cooperating, they actually are using the resources faster and they are sort of self-killing or, yeah each other and so that's sort of what's happening to some extent here what's happening is the multis are using the resources but there's they cannot move and they are sort of competing with each other and even if they evolve cooperation that wouldn't help because there's more competition at that local scale and so we wanted to see we knew that there was a cost sort of in competition, but we wanted to see what were the consequences in terms of evolution for these um, 
of growing in these plates, in this spatially structured environment. And so we started with multicellular populations and we did three replicates where we grew them in plates. So we had, of the 10 original populations, we took six strains and each of those six strains, we started three replicate lines. So we had 18 total lines. And we grew them on plates over a certain time. And within a week or two, we basically had the evolution of single cells again. So all the multicellular isolates had become unicellular again because of the cost of dispersing in a spatially structured environment. Um, so is this clear so far? Are these questions up to this point? Yeah, yeah well, well, I guess, I guess I'm wondering, I'm wondering I'm gonna flash the, the microphone. Um, I'm wondering if you could go back to that original paradox that you showed early on of like there was there was the chart that showed that the fitness consequences of of you know when when you're on a when you're on a plate it shouldn't matter whether you're multicellular or not and then you had the second chart which showed that it did and then you you told us this whole story about you know dispersal mechanisms and all the rest and I'm wondering how how that story that you just told affects that apparent paradox in those first two slides yeah, um, let me go back. So basically what we have here is that they are growing, so this is the spatially structure. Uh, you're still, can you turn your slides back on? Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> so here they are, in the spatially structured environment, and they're growing at the same rate. So what's happening is within, but this is just looking at a single colony. And so okay. basically, if you put a single colony and it's growing, what you see is that multicellular or unicellular, they are not really moving on the plate and they are competing with each other a lot and they're growing really slowly compared to in liquid where things are moving around and they get more access to nutrients. Here they, even if the plate has a lot of nutrients, they only get the nutrients right next to it, them and the little that diffuses in there. Um, and so that's why multis and unis are growing the same. Mm -hmm. The difference between this experiment and the fitness one is that for the fitness one the competition experiment was over three days mm -hmm. each day we would grow them on a plate then basically take all that was in a plate dilute it and grow them again mm -hmm. and each time we do that we are basically taking everything that grew and then dispersing it again when we put it again in the plate. Mm -hmm. and the difference there is when we disperse them, the unis will disperse all over the place, whereas the multis will still remain in like big groups and they will not be able to take a, as good advantage of the resources as the unis were doing. And so when we do the selection experiment, it's the same thing, the multis, we are putting multis all the time. And if you have a mutation that makes you smaller or uni, then that mutation will make that in the next transfer, you'll get to access more nutrients again. And over time, that's what's being selected and favored. So, so you repeated the selection experiment, not in a test tube, but on a, on a plate setup. Yeah. Yeah. And and you started with a multicellular uh, yeast, and you repeated the selection experiment, and what you found was that you were actually selecting for smallness, not thickness, because smallness aids in dispersal on the plate. Exactly. Okay. And so, what's cool 
I mean, I think there's a lot of cool things about that. But the other part is that while the question of how do you evolve multicellular when you're unicellular is pretty common, we've during evolution, we also have seen changes from multicellular back to single cells. So like actually yeast evolved from a multicellular ancestor. And so is these changes back have been have not really been studied and we don't necessarily know what how do they go back, how does that affect their single cell state, what changes go there. And so I think this is a cool experiment to start looking at what are the consequences once you were multicellular of being back unicellular. Mm -hmm. So since then, and I don't um, have slides for these here, but um, since then we've actually done experiments going back to multicellular and back to unicellular and back to uni multicellular and trying to see how each of those steps is affecting the change. Wow, that's the, really cool. Yeah, and one of the cool things we, we have found is that depending on what changes made you multicellular in the same, in the first place, how easily you're gonna become back unicellular <clears throat> and how sort of continuous that change will be. So in most of the populations where multicellularity evolved by this sort of main change in a transcription factor called ACE2, mm -hmm. they evolved multicellularity through a like loss of function of this transcription factor. <clears throat> in those cases, they tend to revert back to unicellularity in a sort of um, qualitative manner where it's like your traits are multicellular or unicellular and they go between these two things. Mm -hmm. Based but on whether other, the gene functions or not, the, the transcription factor. Yeah. But in other populations, what we saw is that they go from big multicellular to smaller, 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 smaller till they are unicellular. Oh. A question. Um, yeah. With the experiments where you go back and forth for like making these yeast cells multi and unicellular, have you found that like there is a gene that makes that transition happen faster? That that um, the transition from multi to uni um, is quicker. Like, does that did that happen? And did that like gene get uh, passed down to the next? Um, set of cells so we're currently we're right now we just send um sort of the yeast for sequencing so right now we don't know what the genes are that are helping making this change back and forth but what we i think that's a great question um but what we are seeing is that there is in certain cases where we do get that eventually after many multi and then uni and then multi and then uni, they just start switching really easily. Like it, it almost seems as if they, if it's becoming a sort of plastic trait where they can sense like, okay, time to be uni, time to be multi instead of a whole sort of genetic change. And that's when we're starting to try to figure out what's going on there. Um, yeah, so I think in sort of conclusion for, and I think we can go now to sort of questions and discussion, but I think in conclusion that a big thing is multicellularity represents one of the biggest changes in size in the fossil record. So if one looks at the fossil record, there's two points where the fossil record changes dramatically in the like average size of organisms. One is when eukaryotes evolve. The other one is when multicellular organisms evolve. And so we have this massive change in size and reorganization of cells. <clears throat> 
And the truth is we do not know that much how these changes affect the subsequent evolution or their ecology. And these are like massive the reorganizations of the environment, of how cells interact with each other, of how cells interact with their environment. And in this case, we're showing that, first of all, evolving multicellularity, just even in liquid without changing anything else, it really produces a big cost in growth because nutrients cannot get, you cannot get the same access to nutrients. But in addition, when you grow them in plates, because multicellular organisms, unless they evolve some, some form of dispersal, because they are basically clustered together, they will have higher rates of local competition. And that local competition can lead to disintegration of the whole organism and can lead to sort of not getting, not moving and evolving more complexity in some ways. It's like a major limitation for the evolution of complex multicellularity. Um, so, so I guess I, I want to go back to, I guess, some of the ideas that you introduced in that very first slide, with, with showing the, the building that had been rebuilt and rebuilt. Um, and so I, I guess basically what you're saying is, you know, the, the, the stories, or correct me if, if this is not what, what you were saying, is that the stories that we typically tell about the evolution of multicellularity, they have to do with this, this, this long, long, well-trodden path talking about uh, cooperation problems, cooperation versus cheating, and tragedy of the commons, and prisoner's dilemmas, and all these sort of like game theoretic things about whether you cooperate or not. And I think what you're saying is that those things are all important, but there's this even simpler, like, geometrical problem that you have to overcome of, like, you can have all the cooperation that you want, but if you don't have an efficient way of distributing resources around your radically different body, now that you're cooperating, that the whole thing can break down. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's the main point. And I'm now sort of working on some modeling and some... Yeah, more theoretical aspects. But the other cool thing is, depending on the geometrical nature of the organism and how it became to be together, so sort of what I show of comparing aggregation versus clonal multicellularity. So even how you get constructed as an organism actually shapes how likely are you to be able to evolve or not cooperation. Partly because cooperation already depends so much on this spatial structure. Um, and so I think that's interesting is we have these, I'm not saying these things are not important, as you say. I'm just saying that there's a simple, simpler constraint that precedes all that and that that simpler constraint actually affects how likely you are to evolve or not cooperation. And, how likely you are or not to evolve for the further complexity. Hmm. Yeah. So it's <clears throat> it's I don't know, I find really interesting because different multicellular organisms are constructed in different ways and that actually does affect a lot of things about them. So one easy way of thinking of seeing this is plants or corals or organisms like that, when especially plants and fungi, when they develop, cells don't move all over the place. They develop by sort of growing in a certain mm -hmm. direction and cells don't go back in the organism or move all over. Yeah. And because of that, cells kind of keep a spatial structure. And so even if they would develop tumors, so like plants develop galls when they get invaded by certain insects or bacteria or fungi, those tumors will always remain localized and cannot, a tree cannot develop a sort of metastasis, mm -hmm. if you will. But in animals, our development, the there's so much movement of cells all over the place. There's so much 
this person that it can actually break cooperation in the whole body. And so we can have a tumor that then it's able to move all over the place and invade other places and take over our, our whole bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of an example of how the way multicellular organisms are just organizing them actually shapes sort of the consequences for cooperation and all sorts of things. That's so interesting. So interesting. Um, um, well, okay. God damn it, this mic thing. <laughs> okay, uh, so I guess I'd like to hear from the students a little bit. I guess I'm wondering, um, I'd love to just sort of hear you, you know, maybe try to paraphrase some of the arguments that we've been hearing to make sure that you, you have a, a, a grip on, on what's going on. Like, would anyone like to try to describe the experiment that Maria described to us and, and the, the kinds of the implications that the experiment shows? Um, I actually have a question about the start, if I can try to describe yeah. it and maybe question answer. Yeah. yeah. So um, in the ex experiment, she isolates the larger yeast cells and then uses those to replicate because they'll form colonies of multicellular units. Um, I think I just missed the reason as to why they'll form colonies. Is it because the larger ones can't move as well and are being outcompeted by smaller pro prokaryotes, similar to how the multicellular complexes, you know, can't move and, and get resources? Or is there just is, is it just that their large size influences them to want to, you know, merge membranes and form these larger units? Sorry, you're muted. I've unmuted you now. Oh, you didn't hear anything I said? <laughs> no, no, I got you. I, I, I muted Maria because my mic was feeding back. Oh. The perils of online teaching. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that we isolated. Um, let me see if I have. Uh, it's, it's not so much that we isolated. the biggest cells um, no i don't have it here what we isolated was big multicellular groups oh actually this might help well chris was your question about the original snowflake yeast experiment where they're in a watery medium yeah yeah like when they took all the single cell oh. yeast and the original formation of the multicellular complex Oh yeah, that I can explain. Um, so basically, when you put them in a in the tube, you're selecting for whatever is bigger, and there's two ways of becoming bigger: either all this the cell becomes bigger, or the cells remain attached to each other, and then as a whole, you are much bigger. And so the problem is that cells can only get so big because the larger a cell gets, the volume is increasing faster than the surface area. And so there's a point where the cell has sort of a lot of inside, but not enough contact with the surface to really make nutrient flux efficient. And so that's why big, even big cells are very branchy so that they can they are maximizing surface area and that's why our intestine has sort of all sorts of texture to maximize that surface area so in this case it's harder to become a gigantic cell than to just not separate from your daughter and remain as a big ball that then can sink to the bottom and that's why that evolved multicellularity Okay, so let me just see if I have this. So basically, because there's so much volume inside the cell, the cell is kind of sharing membrane surface area with its, you know, neighboring cell, so it can be more efficient with, you know, osmosis over the membrane and transmission of nutrients and such. Yeah, and it's just it's just an easier change to remain attached and become bigger by being in a big group that become bigger by me becoming bigger. So if, let's say we were 
the yeast and we're all sort of swimming around if we get pushed to the bottom and whoever is sort of bigger and heavier gets faster to the bottom it's much easier to just you know all of us hug each other and get really close and follow that like that then each of us suddenly having like gigantic arms and gigantic head and you know it it's just easier to become big by becoming part of a group that become big by just growing in some ways chris i think i think the point that you may be confused about is the selection part um so the in the initial experiment what was done was that the the very very bottom part of the tube was removed and and used to propagate the next generation so they're selecting anything that can get to the bottom by any means and it can get to the bottom by any means either by being big or by being multicellular okay that makes sense to me um i have one further question if that's okay um so in the uh, further ex experiment where you had all the multicellular colonies growing on the same plate as the single cells and you were showing that you know the single cells had much more cells after a a few days were there any instances where near the multicellular colony its neighboring single cells attempted to join the colony and mm. fuse like is that possible or can it only become multicellular with its own like uh offspring yeah so in this case in this particular case um the yeast are not sticky and they cannot fuse to their multicellular um in addition they cannot you know, in the plate, it's actually not convenient to be in a bigger group. You want to be alone and keep all the resources um, that you can get. However, in other experiments, we've seen that yeast, when they are a little bit sticky, they can have these crazy interactions between being multicellular by just growing um, as I show here, just by mother, mother and daughter cells staying together, but they can also, unis can stick to them, and they, when in the initial experiment, in the settling experiment, and then they can sort of get passed to the next generation. Um, and there's some cool work of another postdoc in the lab doing that. Um, um, so I have a question. Um, I don't think I fully, heard or understood maybe, but where, what is the transition between the first experiment and the second? Like, yeah. Um, so uh, let me show an image because I think that part was not um, necessarily clear. So this is how the sort of experiment goes. And so this is the initial experiment where we all started with single cells and grew them in 10 replicate populations and they did this sort of settling selection where only the big ones which eventually are multicellular get passed to the next generation and so what happens then is they evolve 10 different populations and i took just a single clone from each of the populations, just of the first six, because the experiment was getting pretty big. Um, and then with each of those, I started three new, ex three new replicates and grew them, those three in plates. Does that sort of make it clearer? Yeah. Um, and so those initial multicellular had different sizes and I just wanted to see if I could get replication not only within an isolate, but even if I started with different multicellular isolates, can I get the same result? Um, and part of that is that, so in the fitness experiment, so these are the different populations I started, the different isolates I started and are in the X axis. And they have slightly different costs, even though they are all paying a cost against the unicellular ancestor. The cost is slightly different. 
And so that's why I wanted to see if the consequences were different. Um, and they are in, in sort of how many days it takes for them to become unicellular, but they all become unicellular and they all do it pretty fast. I, does that sort of answer? Yeah. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, so is the cost higher to, like, so is the cost of being multicellular higher on an agar plate than it is to be in, like, a liquid tube? Is that what yeah. that one graph shows? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's what was, sort of surprising is that even their growth was the same, but the cost was higher in an agar plate than in liquid. Whereas in liquid, we had seen that the unis grew faster, but then the cost was a little bit less. And that was sort of what was surprising initially. And, and Victoria, why, why do you think that would be? Well, so I know that she was saying that like, um, the resources are kind of concentrated on the agar plate. So I guess, I mean, if you're bigger and you have limited resources, you can't really access them. Where I, well, so if you're bigger, you need more resources, right? Like if you're a small cell, you probably don't need as much to survive. So you can kind of get away with what's in your general area. But if you're multicellular, you need more and there's not really a ton in your area if you're using it up and you can't really move around to get to other resources. I don't yeah. know if that makes any sense or if that's in any yeah. way correct, but. That's totally right. That's totally right. Okay. Um, did you also say that the unicellulars grow better in the, um, media, like the tube media than the multicellulars? Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, so imagine, imagine you have like a sponge or something. Can you, can you turn off your screen share? What? Can you oh. turn off the screen? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Imagine you have like a sponge and it's like a circle. The bigger it is, the longer it will take for the liquid to get to the center. And so if you have single cells, immediately the nutrients get into the cell. If you have a multicellular that's bigger and the nutrients take a little bit longer to get all the way in. And so that's why in liquid, the single cells are growing faster. Okay. And so, so for the plate um, experiment, would it also be because um, the, since yeast cells can't grow out too much they grow like they grow on top of each other like the 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 cells in the middle wouldn't get any nutrients yeah okay so did those cells start like dying then um they don't but they're they're still growing and they're still getting nutrients but they're growing slower they're getting nutrients at a slower rate and they're growing a little bit slower and there's not that much space to grow um, we are not seeing that they are dying a whole lot. They're just not growing. Um, and where you were saying sort of because the cells cannot move, they kind of do grow on top of each other. They, colonies of microbes in general grow something like these. So there's some growing on top of each other and some sort of expanding at the edge. But it takes a long time for this expansion to happen. Um, and that, that is the same either if you are unicellular or multicellular. It just, the difference is they start like that, but when we then take all the cells and spread them again, the unicellulars get all over the place. The multicellulars are very big and just get to one place. So the resources per cell, each cell, each single cell has more resources per cell than the multicellular one. So did you have to do something to stop the single, the unicellular cells from um, like reproducing? The no. Oh, sorry, go on. Um, 
I was gonna say because I'm assuming that if they have enough nutrients and they're in like a a media that they like, they'll start reproducing. Yeah. So so both the multicellular and the unicellular are reproducing. So that's sort of what um, Maximus was asking when in that sort of um, slide where I had the simulation results, there were many, many more cells than a multicellular organism has in a certain area. And that's because they have reproduced. And the same, the unicellular, they have reproduced a lot. Um, so even though they are reproducing and they're still competing with each other, the difference is how many resources they had initially. And those resources translate in how many cells you can do in a certain place. So let's say that for one unit of resources, you get to do one cell, right? And so in a certain area, you have a thousand units of resources. If all the multicellular cells, 10 cells in a multicellular organism land in that area, no matter that you started with 10 cells, you're only going to be able to do a thousand cells in that point. Versus the unicellular one, each cell arrived to a different point where it could make a thousand cells total. So now you have 10 times a thousand, you have 10,000 cells total versus the multicellular that all the 10 cells could only make a thousand given the resources locally. I don't know if that sort of helped explain. Yeah, so, so then if, like with your, uh example if those unicellular and multicellular all made those the, the, the thousand cells would that wouldn't then the unicellular uh, cells also end up running out of resources in their region yeah they do and they end up running out of resources but by the time they but because they are in different regions each of them goes out of resources but by that point they all have made up to a thousand cells in their own regions, whereas the multicellular could only do a thousand cells in its tiny region and could not keep sort of expanding. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So I guess, you know, the, the, the thought experiment that pops into my mind here is like if you, if you had an, two empty plates and you seeded one empty plate with a single cell yeast and one empty plate with a multi cell yeast, you would expect that the single-celled plate would be covered quick more quickly than the multi-celled plate would be covered? If you started with a single cell, they would probably get to, the multicellular would, that's where it gets complicated. It would, you would see them with one cell only, with one multicellular and one single cell. The multicellular would actually grow faster because it's, sort of it started a little bit later in the growth curve. Mm -hmm. Let me, I actually think I might have Isn't that in a your little diagram? thing that might. What? Isn't that in your diagram where you had the, the 10 cell multicellular, uh, it, like individual yeast colony, and then you had like 10 individual unicellular? Yeah. Like, is that what the example was? Yeah, so the thing is, if you start just with one cell, mm -hmm. the multicellular is started with more cells, so it will get right. to a thousand, let's say, faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because but in you, general, the unicellular growth rate is faster. In the plates, is the same. That's what's mm -hmm. tricky. Oh, okay. Um, what's the difference is... Um, What the difference is that you don't have one unicellular cell, you have many. Mm -hmm. And because you have many, they are not just in one part of the plate, they are all over. And they manage to be in more places. So one way of thinking about it is, the multicellular organism is, in some ways, a city, right? And so, a city grows, faster and but it requires resources from many places all over the world if we 
you know, if New York City could only consume the resources in New York City, Everyone there would be, yeah, there would be no New York City. It yeah. depends on resources from all over the world. Whereas if you go to where you are in rural Virginia, you know, mo a lot of resources are coming sort of locally and are it's able to sort of sustain because yeah. you're smaller you don't need as many resources and then you can have many villages that are more distributed and each is just consuming the local resources and it's able to grow so mm -hmm. in this case the problem of the multicellular organisms is they they cannot import resources from far away in the plate they can only take what's there Mm -hmm. And they are too big to use those resources. They use those resources immediately and they cannot bring them from elsewhere. Whereas these single cells are more distributed. So even though they cannot bring resources from elsewhere, each of them is smaller and can take local resources enough to sustain their growth. Right. Um, can you describe the the selection criteria for the plate part of the experiment? Because in the in the tube part, it's clear like there's there's gravity and, and so you're you're selecting for bigness. Um, how did you isolate parts of one plate to move to the next plate? Like what was what was the the decision making the selection process for that? Yeah. So so there. What's cool is and I'm, I'm actually the selection process is growing in the plate because what i'm doing is they grow in the plate and then i take i would grab basically liquid and take everything as well as i could everything that was in the plate mm -hmm. and then dilute that so what i'm transferring is directly proportional it's a sort of sample of what was in the plate I so the see. better you grow in the plate the more likely you are to get transferred to the next plate Gotcha. Okay. And then when you did the transfer, what you found was that the the the, the organisms would be randomly distributed. Yeah. And because there were more single celled organisms than multi celled organisms, the single celled ones had more chance to proliferate and then you had a a, a selection sweep or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a kind of complicated and counterintuitive sort of result in some ways. Once it's once it's clear, it becomes almost like tautologically. It almost it becomes almost too obvious. Mm -hmm. But but because it's not that intuitive that something that grows faster would have lower fitness. Mm -hmm. And because it's not that easy to understand why, how the dispersal is affecting the growth in the plate and how this like distribution matters in terms of access to resources. Um, that, that is the part that is not that intuitive. And I think that's why we haven't paid that much attention to dispersal um, when thinking about multicellularity. Yeah, well, that thing that you just said, right, like just a moment ago, the distribution matters in terms of access to resources. Um, you know, because I guess the the you know what what time is it? It is it is it is one thirty, so I can I can let my imagination loose a little bit, right? I mean, so I I study cooperation in the in the abstract, right, or or in the abstract, but also specifically, you know, I'm I'm fixated on these these fleshy primates that we are. And and I, because because cooperation among humans is really hard, like it fails all the time, and you know so there's this this sort of pipe dream idea that watching how cooperation works in the biological world in the abstract can give us insight into how to make human cooperation better. At least that's the hope. Is that by 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 looking at the entire sweep of nature that we have that we might be able to figure out how to make our groups less dysfunctional because right now they're very dysfunctional um so i guess given that framing i'm wondering what what does what does this system and this experiment make you think about how to make cooperation work in 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 a human context or, or just in any other context that isn't yeast on an agar plate yeah well 
I think something that it makes clear to me are, well, there's a few things I can think. One is that While for cooperation and complexity to evolve, we need actually a lot of cells, you know, like the complexity of a city is much more than a small town or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to happen, we first need to figure out efficient ways of getting resources and distributing the resources all over. Otherwise, competition is going to just be harsher and it's going to be unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the first aspect of it. So efficient use of resources and a better distribution. The other part that I think of is how movement matters. So if you get no movement at all, you're going to basically destroy the local environment and the local resources. There's going to be tons of conflict, and that's not going to work. But if you're also moving people all the time, there's no like community building. There's no creating relations. There's no building of cooperation. So you cannot either, you know, like it happens in the US a lot that everyone moves all the time and no one especially nowadays and no one actually has the time to stay in a place to build community to build relations to create the sort of necessary um threats to build cooperation really that is i think that's a really costly um aspect mm -hmm. um but on the other hand if we would never move you know like resources are not equally distributed all over the globe and we would just not be able to survive and sustain the population sizes we have and so you need some movement but not not complete disruption of spatial structure and interactions mm -hmm. i think yeah i think both creating communities locally and having enough movement that allows for learning and acquiring information and resources and sharing um uh, it would be sort of ideal problem is we don't do either very well we restrict the movement of some but not others and yeah. we, we allow for resources for movement of resources only in some directions etc so that complete that's a whole that's when when biology is not enough to explain and we have all sorts of political and social social and historical processes taking place like you know legacies of colonialism of where resources are coming from and where do they get to go and things like that that's that's where i think evolution provides a little bit of explanation, and then we need to add all this other complexity that comes from other processes. Yeah, well, the cool thing about what you're doing is you kind of, you're kind of going in the other direction. Like, yeah, we might need to think about culture and history and all of these things to explain it, but you've almost taken a step back and said, like, wait, like, we don't even necessarily need to think about the fitness consequences of, of cheating and cooperation and altruism we just need to look at geometry. Um, I mean, maybe maybe that's a little a little oversimplistic, but I, I I'm I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more of just like the the importance of thinking about spatial distribution and 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 how framing your thought in that way has has um, has influenced the, the 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 kinds of conclusions that you've reached. Yeah, I think I sometimes think of what I'm doing as a sort of geography of microbes or geography of major transitions and and what i mean by that is that even when we think about history and political conflicts and culture and society 
these things occur not only in a certain time but in a certain place and in relationships of places to each other and they depend on how resources are distributed and they depend on how we can access those resources and all these things so i think what i'm saying is we have paid attention to sort of the history and culture but we have left behind the geo the geographical dimensions of these and so you cannot understand the whole thing if you don't put it in a place mm -hmm. um, and so it's not it's not that cheating and cooperation don't matter or something like that is that we need to look at it and understand it in their geometrical context in their physical context and and that that context actually shapes a lot of how we interact with each other and it shapes a lot of how cells interact with each other and how organisms come to be. Um, and the other thing that I, I think is really cool is we know that organisms and we, we've known for a while that organisms interact in space and they like cope and the degree to which they compete and cooperate depends a little on this space. But what we haven't thought as much is that organisms actually create space all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, what's really cool about multicellularity is that it really changes how cells interact and how cells are organized in space. Like, I don't know, if you think of like my neuron, like one of my neurons, like, it's in a solely tiny environment that's shaped by my whole development and my evolution. And it, it's interacting with cells in a way that single cells would have never interact with each other mm -hmm. um, because the context has completely changed. So I think that's sort of where I'm interested in seeing these things. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, this is this is probably too vague, but I mean, what what you just said there, right? I mean, because you're, you're talking about niche construction, basically, yeah. right? That that the evolutionary processes create these organisms that are capable of creating their own niches, and um, I, that's there's no question in there. But I guess like the well, no, okay, there is a question, which is I the for me it gets to this like. This teleology problem of like if you've got you've got if you've got organisms that are so strongly biasing the environment that they're in, like how do we how do we track evolutionary processes when there's that like really intense feedback loop? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think in one way, something that's something I like to think is that development is just I, I don't want to say is just but it's ecological interactions that because the environment has been so canalized and the environment itself is sort of being inherited mm -hmm. the ecological interactions are being passed through generations and that's sort of what development is in some ways yeah um so i think it's really cool because it's not just that organisms are evolving these sort of niche construction, but that that is getting passed in generation over generation in a way that's very, that's fairly reliable. And so that's actually shaping how our cells interact with each other and it's shaping that, you know, genes, it's shaping how just differences in expression in genes create all the complexity in my body when you know, my cells are basically all clones from each other. Um, and so I think that's sort of where I see part of this sort of niche construction being really interesting. It sort of allows for complex development. That's 
that's a really cool way to frame it that that um development is is basically a form of environmental inheritance that's that's a really cool i really like that that jump jumping levels in in thought that's really it's great well and i think something that's that i've sort of pushed a lot is when we think about multicellularity Because we're used to things like us humans, we just think like you're either unicellular or you're multicellular. And once you're multicellular, there's almost no selection at the cell level. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of that's sort of true true for us in sort of a longer evolutionary time scale where every human generation we go through a single bottleneck which actually does restrict evolution at the cell level quite a bit but within our bodies there's evolution happening mm -hmm. and it's not like one level suddenly disappears completely um and in these transition moments it is particularly interesting because both levels are acting and under different circumstances, one level might act more than another. Yeah. And so I like how that conflict, or not necessarily conflict, but how that eventually gets sort of worked out in different ways. Right. Well, because they talk about, I mean, particularly brain development as an evolutionary process. That you know, there are there are neurons that die off and synapses that 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 patterns that form by by selection and that's totally selection at the cellular level so it's yeah. not that it's not that selection at that level doesn't doesn't have an impact on on evolutionary dynamics it's just it's just insulated in some ways yeah yeah similarly the this immune system it's sort of being um it's evolving in some ways yeah Well, cool. Thanks for for humoring me off the off the, the philosophy deep end. I suppose. Um, are there are there any more questions that you folks have? Students have. Yes. One last question, just to really round it out. So, <laughs> for the uh, comparison between the broth and the agar, um, multi unicellular. In the broth, the unicellulars grew faster. And in the agar, the multicellulars would grow faster, but they didn't because their resources ran out. Yeah. So, so the difference is in the broth, they both have sort of same access to resources. In the broth, the single cells have more access to resources just because they have like all the cells are so are basically swimming in the broth versus in the multicellular where the internal cells are growing slower so that part is completely right um and then in the agar they both per cell they grow at the same rate but single cells are better at securing more resources and so they can grow faster okay Yeah. I have, a, I have a quick question. Yeah. Yeah, but so in the other, wouldn't the multicellular cells um, have a um, spike in growth and later on um, have a reduced amount of growth? Oh, in the figure where there were spikes going up and down? No, I'm asking like in general, like in the, in the other, like when the multi, because he was saying they, they have the chance, you know, at a specific place in the agar to absorb the nutrients. So I'm asking, wouldn't they go more faster initially since um, they are they are more dense and they have, you know, they have they are more, they are much than the unicellular. Wouldn't they have a spike and later on reduce because then their nutrients are going to reduce? Yeah, so that's totally right. And you can 
And you can sort of see that in the simulation. Um, so at the very beginning, actually it's easier for me to point out things like this. Um, so it's hard to see, but here is, these are the unicellular and it's almost all just one color. Whereas the multicellular at that early time point, they already have grown into larger density in their own little patches. That's what you are saying. They first kind of spike faster than multicellular, but then over time is the single cells. Yeah. It's the single cells that are taking more resources and are growing faster than the multicellular at the end. So you're right that at first multis would peak and then they would start growing slower. So for the plate then they don't have the same growth rate if the multi would grow faster? Or is it because they have more cells that they grow faster? It's because they have more cells. Oh, okay. Hello. Well, we are nearing the end of the class period. So, Marina, thank you so very much uh, for for giving this lecture. It was super interesting, um, yeah. and 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 especially for like really walking us through the the different procedures because there's a lot of steps to this, and it's it's easy to just sort of get lost in the details. But I think the what comes out of it is is rather profound, actually. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and, um, yeah. So, so the way this works is that we're all going to make videos about it. So we'll, we'll send you the videos when we're done. Um, cool. And thank you all. I think your questions were great and, um, it really helps to sort of figure out what the best ways of explaining these and what parts are sort of complicated and um, it's it's really useful for me. So thank you. Thank Great. you. Yeah. Um, so I, I here I will so I'll end the broadcast here.